Warning, heavy spoilers following. One tale that writers and storytellers have explored time and time again is the descent into the underworld, or in ancient Greek, Catabasis. Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice, is the latest in a long series of works that explore the team of a hero, or heroine, in this case, venturing into the underworld in an attempt to save their beloved. In the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, the nymph and daughter of Apollo was bitten by a viper and subsequently died after a mournful gig played and sang by recent widower Orpheus, the gods give him the opportunity to venture into Hades' realm and plead for her return amongst the ranks of the living. Even Hades is touched. We'll get back to how all that ends a bit later. Here we have Senua, named after the early and incorrect first name of the cultic goddess Senune, pardon the pronunciation, knowledge of whom was only recently obtained. Unlike Dante, and very much like Orpheus, that's Dante from The Divine Comedy, she knows what she's in for, a journey through the underworld. Not just any underworld, however. And here is one difference that I can't stress enough. Senua doesn't venture to her own underworld, invited by her gods to seek recourse after the unjust death of her beloved, the way Orpheus did. No. Senua goes into Hell, the domain of Hela, the wretched half-rotten Norse goddess of the dead, a Celtic warrior into the Norse underworld. She doesn't belong, and for that her course is all the more perilous. See Orpheus once again. His venture into Hades, while ultimately unsuccessful, didn't present a danger to his person. It's his weakness and lack of faith that cost him Eurydice. Hades and all the other gods are, if anything, too helpful. Senua doesn't have that problem. No helpful Celtic god eases the way. Every step is a challenge and often enough a downright torment. A lone aid is the spirit of a deceased slave of the Nords, who later turned Skald, and Skalds are poets, a sort of Virgil-like character called Drat. While versed in the Norseman's beliefs and legends, her old mentor is one of two spirits to offer Senua even momentary comfort. The other is Dillian. Dillian is the spirit of her lover. The other is Dillian, her lover. His spirit serves as a guiding light in Senua's weakest moments, reminding her why she's there. And yet, those are better sweet moments, for Senua's happiness quickly seeps away, leaving her somehow more alone than ever. But that is to be expected. After all, our heroine doesn't seek to restore Dillian back to life. She merely seeks to save his soul. To that end, she carries his head to use as a vessel, or a sort of compass to lead the way. In that sense, Dillian plays the most important role of Virgil from Dante's Inferno. That is, his spirit is the one to lead Senua through the underworld, whereas Drood fulfills the more exposition-heavy but secondary role of tour guide. Dante's Inferno describes the recognition and rejection of sin. It is less a tale of lost love than a tale of punishment. Orpheus's descent showcases how much a man's lack of fate can cost him. Senua's journey is about making peace with the grief of loss, pain, and her very own demons, which are more often than not not literal, but figurative. Because you see, that entire descent into hell this video is about, it doesn't really happen, as you may know if you have played the game. It's all a result of Senua's psychosis. It's an incredible journey into the mind of a woman whose mental condition forces her to face demons of an old, cruel world. Demons who seem very much real. But the worst one of all is not one you do combat with, not a Norseman who Senua sees as a monstrous godling, but the voice of the darkness. There is no one here but me. Not you. Did you think that I would let you go? That you lost me back in the wilds? I will never let you go. You can't get rid of me. I am your shadow. And I will be watching when you draw your last dying gasp. I'm not ready to die. 
You will be when you see what they did to your dear beloved. they came through stormy black seas they raided these shores do you still hear his screams and now at your home he's so far away they've taken his soul These gods you cannot pray. That is the voice of Senua's father. As the game progresses, it becomes evident that he abused his daughter, both physically and mentally. He believed that her condition and that of Senua's mother, Galena, was a curse sent from the gods. He burned Galena in front of their daughter, making Senua's psychosis so much worse. Every time, Senua finds a moment of respite if you will, a moment of hope. The darkness forces the past onto her, reminds her of her isolation. Through it all, Senua perseveres on her quest, finally realizing the true extent of her father's influence, the poison and vitriol of his hold over her, and freeing herself of it. How does she do it? By accepting that the voices in her head, the Furies, are no curse, but a part of her and that the death of Dillian was not her fault. And that is, I think, the most important descent into the underworld yet, for it shows our heroine ready to risk all to save what's most important to her, only to find and make peace with herself along the journey and realize the limits of her own mortality. Those are my thoughts about Hellblade's Senua's Sacrifice, a story to a very thin layer of mythological examples. I would have loved to include a few more myths, like that of the Sumerian goddess Inanna, or Hermod's journey to the same Norse hell in an attempt to retrieve the god Baldr after Loki's trickery cost the god his life. Unfortunately, both of these didn't have nearly as many parallels as I would have liked, even though Hermod's journey is through the same hell we see in one way or another in a different interpretation in Hellblade. Plus, it's good to put out a shorter video every once in a while. With that in mind, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, please like this video, subscribe and let me know what you think. Would you enjoy more of this kind of content? Hope so, because I certainly love making it.